All right. I think we're live. Okay. And I think we're live. Myth Vision Podcast here with Dr. David Madison. How are you doing, Dr. Madison? Not too bad. On a uh, Well, the temperature finally broke in New York, so it's not so bad. <laughs> it's definitely warm. <laughs> I will say this. Um, you did an article, and I figure it's it's going to be an intense you know, show where you get to discuss some of these problems. You titled that article, One Two Punch, Christianity Out Cold. Yes. So I had to title this video relevant with the thumbnail, with the boxing gloves, and I might as well make the intro within the vein. So everybody tuning in, like the video, drop a comment, share this content out, and let's get ready for war. Here we go. <laughs> Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. All right, we are Myth Vision. Dr. Madison, welcome back. We've done a couple different episodes on your last, uh, the book that you published, 10 Things right. Christians Wish Jesus Never Taught. Hadn't taught. I hope they go get the book. You hadn't taught. Yeah. Okay. And that's here at Amazon. Links down in the description. The latest, greatest, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught. You can get it right now on eVersion for $3.99. So it is obviously affordable, but it is on Audible, and it is read from an angel of God named Seth <laughs> Andrews. So uh, if you haven't heard the voice of an angel, please check out the Audible book. It is well worth it. Uh, drop a, a review if you've listened and read his books. So that way, you know, Amazon can pay attention. New readers can come along. This was a fun, fast read. It didn't take too long, so I recommend people go check that out. And by the way, as of yesterday, um, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught was up to 200 reader reviews. And something like 70% of them are five stars. So Ooh. it's designed to be read in one or two sittings. So it, it, And it's fun. It's so fun. And, and there's some really valid points. I mean, like clear issues that... Christians really do get like, ah, oh, when I was a Christian, you know, oh, Jesus didn't say hate your mother and your father. I mean, like, you know, yeah. he's, you know, what's he really mean? And then well, he just yeah. means to love them less than you love God or than you love me. And, and we're talking probably an apocalyptic <laughs> movement here. So yeah. there's a good chance you need to forsake all and put everything you have in the basket of Jesus. So um, anyway, check out that book. Check out the website, 10 toughproblemscom You are writing on all of these. Your books are being promoted as well. Badthingsjesustaught.com. And, of course, that's another one of your websites. And the YouTube channel. Tell us about this YouTube channel, David. I haven't recorded anything recently. I've been busy with other things. But there's about 150 videos on there in several different categories, uh, such as... Um, uh, Bible blunders and bad theology, um, uh, cure for Christianity, knockout quotes, um, required homework for Christians. Um, and the first one in the required ho homework for Christians is simply, please read the Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and once you do, things might, just might start to uh, make sense in terms of the way that people are viewing it critically, you might actually go, okay, I get why you're thinking that way. And even if you disagree, you at least understand the problem. So, well, I'd like to, <laughs> I like to say that the four gospel writers had submitted their gospels to the, uh, the committee that was making up the new Testament and they got together at a bar to see who was going to get in. <laughs> they didn't like each other. In fact, they hated each other. <laughs> as that's clear if you read their different versions of the Jesus stories, and their cell phones all ping at the same time. They all got the same text. Congratulations, gentlemen. We're going to accept all four and print them right together. 
and the four gospel authors, authors were hor horrified. We don't want people reading these side by side because they contradict each other. Right. There, are, there are flaws, there are errors. They didn't agree with each other. They, they all had different theologies. Mm. That's why I say my challenge to Christians always is read the whole gospel of Mark straight through without stopping. It'll take about as much time as, as watching a movie. Then relax a few minutes, have a big glass of wine. You'll need the wine. Then do the same thing with John's gospel. Read it straight through without stopping. It'll take you longer. And by the time you're finished, you're saying, what happened here? How come there are these two very, very different uh, pictures of Jesus? These two, these two guys didn't agree. Um, that is an introductory. That, that's a way to see how the Gospels really present such a confused picture of Jesus. But um, that's my challenge to Christians always. Read the Bible. And just be cautious too. the ending um, in Mark. You know, that's another thing that our Bibles try to tack in there. Consider that. Pay attention to the details and the article that you just wrote, which was on debunking Christianity, debunking dash, if you will, Christianity.com. Um, and I put it in the description of this video where you're just doing a one, two punch. We're going to talk about each punch. And uh, I'll allow you to describe each of these punk these punches that uh, knock out Christianity cold, which had to you know make the thumbnail uh, catchy because that's exactly what your article is about. Mm. So we'll get into that. And then last of all, if you want real salvation, not the fake stuff, join MythVision's Patreon. <laughs> I mean, you can't find salvation outside of MythVision. This is the true way um, to yourself to discovering the facts of reality. So please check us out. Help support us. We can use all the help we can get. And uh, with that being said, Dr. Madison, let's get to your article. And then I will allow you to freestyle wherever we want to allow this conversation to go. And then our audience can send in questions and they could steer the direction of the conversation. All I ask is that the audience is decent, respectful, um, and feel free to be critical. Okay. Um. It's just surveys have shown that Christians don't usually read the Bible. Uh, the vast majority of Christians have not read the Bible straight through. And as I indicated early, earlier, it would be very unusual if any Christian sat down and read the whole Gospel of Mark straight through. They don't binge read the Gospels. Um, nor do they study Christian origins in depth. Uh, they take what their preacher tells them. They take what their parents tell them. They believe the Bible tells us so, so that's what we believe. But any in-depth study of the mythology, the magical thinking, the superstitions of the ancient world display the background into which Christianity was born. And uh, in the article, I I cite the, uh, um, in, this, in this article, I, I cite a, uh, a 2018 article by Richard Carrier, uh, the title of which is Dying and Rising Gods, It's Pagan Guys, Get Over It. Uh, <laughs> You're going to love me. I, I did a video actually on this, on uh, MidVision. Yeah, it's top 10. I just titled it Top 10 Dying and Rising Gods. And uh, I almost want to like, just feel free to continue. I, I do want to play a clip of it because I think it's worth people watching. Yeah, um, Christians don't really grasp that so much that was grafted onto the Jesus story comes from the pagan beliefs from which Christianity emerged. For example, the virgin birth idea, that a God was uh, conceived, um, a, a God like Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, born of the Virgin Mary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was such a common belief in the ancient world that gods, demigods, heroes had been conceived uh, by God via Holy Spirits or whatever. Matthew and Luke, for whatever reason, decided, hey, this would be a good idea. Let's add this to the Jesus story. Mark knew nothing about it. Uh, 
the Gospel of John's author. It's hard to believe he didn't know uh, that Matthew and Luke had done this, but he decided not to do it. He didn't need to do it because he had such a an elevated view of Jesus who had been present at creation. Um, he didn't need a virgin birth to, to guarantee that, that, that Jesus was divine. And of course, the Apostle Paul, in all of his letters, he never, ever mentions the virgin birth of Jesus. In fact, he never, ever mentions, pay attention, Christians, this great hero of the early Christian faith, the Apostle Paul, does not talk about the life and ministry and teachings, the miracles of Jesus. He doesn't mention them. He doesn't even mention the empty tomb story. In the, in the first chapter of Galatians, Paul brags about the fact that he didn't learn about Jesus from any human source. He learned about Jesus from his visions, his revelations. Today, we would call them hallucinations. And that's a bad start for Christianity. To, that's a bad start for Christianity to, to, be, to be dependent upon visions, revelations, hallucinations. But then the really big problem borrowing is that of a rising and dying uh, God. Ry dying and rising gods were a common thing in the ancient belief systems. In fact, you can go all the way back to the gods of vegetation who died in the fall and were resurrected in the spring. It's no coincidence that Easter takes place in the spring. But there were so many other, and, and Richard Carrier in this article, I think he mentions 10 or 12 mm -hmm. of, these, of those heroes, these demigods, these gods who died in many different ways, can I tease them with this? Like yeah, I, I created an intro. Okay. I think you'll appreciate it. Cause you never watched this that I did. I did an edit. I'm kind of proud of it. And maybe <laughs> you'll be proud of me for doing it. Um, okay. Let me show you what I got here. Okay. And Dr. Richard Carrier's mm -hmm. article. And I hope you will go and read it yourself and follow up with his hyperlinks to see the source material for yourself. All of this literature is amazing. So I will be skimming through his article as I read it because it's so long, but it's full of great stuff. The name of his article is Dying and Rising Gods. It's pagan, guys. Get over it. Number one is Jesus. Born of a virgin, does miracles, lives his life, dies, crucified, buried in a tomb. After three days and three nights, says Jonah, and he spit up, and of course, in this particular one, he resurrects and ascends on high. I'm always. Oh, I gotta get paid. Now. They gotta get me they mad. How's it new? Every day. There we go. <laughs> Number two, Osiris. A lot can be said about Osiris, so let me read some and then leave the rest for you to read yourself. Not only does Plutarch say Osiris returned to life and was resurrected, exact terms for resurrection on Isis and Osiris, 35, see his discussion on the empty tomb, and also describe as physically returning to Earth after his death. But the physical resurrection of Osiris's corpse is explicitly described in pre-Christian pyramid inscriptions. Osiris was also resurrected, according to Plutarch, on the third day and died during a full moon just like Christ. Passover occurs during the full moon. And in Plutarch, on Isis and Osiris, 39 and 42, Osiris dies on the 17th of Athar. Okay, so I go through every god like this, David, just so you know. I'm not okay. going to waste any more of your time. I go through Dionysus. I go through Baal. I go through... I go through... Um, uh, who's Herodotus is Zalmoxus. I go through yeah, all yeah, of yeah. them. And... It just made it really good edit and stuff like that. But what do you do? What do you do? So it's the Christians are unaware of this. They simply are unaware of it. Um, there was one Christian on social media who was celebrating the fact that that Jesus has risen. And I pointed out there were many other uh, deities at the time. Uh, men, demigods who were thought to have risen. And 
he said, his response is, yes, but Jesus was really the only one who did it. <laughs> what good would it have done to ask the guy for his data? What was the source of your knowledge? Sir? How do you know that? Oh, the Bible tells me so would be the common answer. But the Bible was written, the, the Gospels were written by, by authors who were fully absorbed into this ancient world of superstition, magical thinking, um, mythology. Uh, they decided to attach it to the story of Jesus. <laughs> it's one of the big problems for Christian apologists that these four stories of the empty tomb on Easter morning, they contradict. They don't align. There are so many discrepancies between them. The story grew with the telling. Um, in fact, and you alluded to this earlier in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, in the original manuscript as we, well, we don't have the original manuscript, but in the oldest manuscripts of Mark that we have, chapter 16 ends at verse 8. The women spoke to a young man in the tomb and they fled and didn't tell anybody. But they were afraid. They were afraid. End of the gospel. And some unknown author at a later time decided, wait a minute, that's good enough. We have to add to that. And so he created a longer ending, um, which includes, by the way, the promise that baptized Christians will be able to touch people by healing them, cast out demons, drink poison, touch, pick up snakes. And there's one more I can't remember. And I want to say, okay, Christians, the resurrected Jesus promised you'd be able to do all, all these things. How are you doing with this list? Have you cast out any demons lately? Have you drunk any poison lately? Have you handled any snakes lately? Uh, that's part of the superstitious mindset of that era. And then, of course, Matthew, Luke, and John came along, and they added to the story of the empty tomb. Um, none, I mean, Christian apologists have spent decades, centuries, trying to reconcile these accounts, but they cannot do it. Um, just like they can't reconcile the two birth narratives in Matthew and Luke. Uh, these guys use their creative imaginations to come up with these stories. Uh, it does not speak well for early Christianity that it was so infested with these kinds of magical thinking. Mm. I mean, all the miracles that you want to point to in the stories of Jesus, I mean, those are duplicated by other miracles in other religions. This was a mindset of the time. Yeah, water into wine. I mean, this is not, there's some interesting things. There's also a situation where people, Heron of Alexandria, I believe it was, which was an engineer in the first century, was hired by the temples to like create steam powered doors that would open and close and the people would believe it was the gods. So there were humans <laughs> manufacturing miracles to the point where, they had pottery that we found that have two compartments in it that they would fill with water and wine. And there was a place where you could hold your thumb over a naked eye wouldn't visibly notice it, but the person holding the wine would. And they would hold the hole, create pressure, pour out water. Then when they released that hole, took their thumb off the hole and they pour it, wine would come out and the compartment of water would close. So they would think, oh my gosh, you have the power to turn water into wine. But really, there's just two compartments in the jar and they're like, we have the actual pottery. My point is whether it is a manufactured actual thing that humans are doing and they're tricking people, or if it's literary, and oftentimes there's literary tropes that we would say, that's probably in the genre of legend or something to embellish, to give portents or something to your, your figure. Go read Suetonius, Lives of the Caesars. You'll see how Cl um, Claudius, he has portents. He has a star at his birth. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A divinized man will be born. The Senate uh, is actually like saying no male child should be reared during this time because they know that the ruler of the world is coming. And sure enough, who does it end up being? Claudius, uh, you know, the first emperor of Rome who actually mm -hmm. comes to rule. But they make up these stories of great men. And you got to imagine the early mo movement of Jesus whether there was a guy or there wasn't a guy, 
the legend is there, no matter what position you take. And Christians commonly fail the curiosity test. If you read any story in the gospel, where did it come from? What is, what is the documentation to back it up? With the gospels, there is no documentation. And by that, mean, I mean contemporaneous documentation. Um, letters, diaries, transcriptions, court records made at the time these events were supposed to have taken place. The gospel writers, as far as we know, didn't have any of that because they didn't. They don't tell us that they had it. They just tell the story. Um, Randall Helms wrote a book back in the 1970s, I believe it was, Gospel Fictions. These guys use their creative imaginations to come up with these stories. Um, and Jesus studies, in, the, in scholarly academic circles, Jesus studies have been in chaos for decades because scholars cannot identify methodologies for determining which stories in the Gospels are true, are accurate, are really history? Because there's so much magical thinking, fantasy, folklore in the Gospels. It, you know it, what's interesting too, Dr. Madison, is I think there was probably a guy. I don't want to get caught up on this. I think there was probably. If you held my feet to the flame. I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, I'm course. not this guy who I think some of my mythicist friends got to give me a little bit more benefit of the doubt because I'm friends yeah, yeah. of everybody on both sides. But like, come on. Like, I just think looking at it, there's probably a guy who was legendized. But you could say there wasn't. At the end of the day, we both disagree that this person, if there was or wasn't, did this. So um, but one of the issues is even in the parables that one could try and say, well, Jews that were around the time may have said parables like this, or we may say Hillel or some of the rabbis at the time may have said similar phrases we find in the mouth of Jesus. And maybe, maybe we have no way to prove it. This may have been something Jesus said if he did exist. whoop de doo There are parables, though, like in Matthew. And I just heard this yesterday from Dr. Um, James Tabor. When we had our live stream, he said there's delay parables that would only have been invented because the delay of the parousia. Mm. You know, the one where it talks about the vineyard owner is gone for a mm. long time and he tarries. Yeah. He goes, this was put in the mouth of Jesus because he hasn't come back yet. And they're all going, mm. uh, how come Jesus isn't here yet? And it's like, they invented parables saying Jesus said these things. So I like what you said. And I talked to another guy, um, you're a, Sefa, I can't pronounce his name. It's like it's a Jewish name, but he's an atheist, a humanist atheist who has two PhDs. And he said he wrote an article a long time ago about the problem with New Testament studies and how they're pretty conservative about the way they approach things. And he wanted to bring interpolation more into the mix because if you start questioning Pauline letters, if you start putting in that may have been inserted, this might have been inserted, there's a resistance by the guild of like, stop. This mm. isn't allowed. They're not fans of interpolation models. And I get it. I mean, how do we know what is and isn't? There's a lot of issues. We have just bad data. It's just not the greatest evidence. The last thing you should be doing is accepting this as the gospel. Mm. The last thing you should be doing is selling your soul on this whole thing and going, ah, I buy the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. You should be cautious in approaching this subject matter before you jump to the conclusion, and oftentimes I think it is the emotion, it is the message, it is the narrative that you're buying, and then you're going out of your way to try and defend that narrative or trying to say, it's not dumb, it, it is true, or find ways to convince yourself, because I think that boils down to what apologetics is. Convincing yourself, oh, you know, that looks bad, but let me, let me see how this can make sure this is true, and then convince others of the same thing. The vast majority of scholars in Christian academia, they went into Christian academia because they believed in Jesus. They are devout Christians. Um, that's their motivation for studying the Gospels. And therefore, um, I think uh, Hector Avalos calls it the ecclesiastical complex. Um, therefore, the 
the tendency in New Testament studies for a long, long time has been to accept the Gospels on some level, N not to question them. Um, if we could prove Jesus did not exist, that would be a disaster mm. for for New Testament studies. But as Richard Carrier says, doesn't make any difference to me whether he existed or not. If he did exist, I don't care. It's no, no skin off my teeth. Um, but that's not what can be said from New Testament scholars in general. Um, I mean, I know I went into seminary because I was a committed Christian. Um, but then you study the Bible too much, too carefully, too closely. <laughs> don't begin. <laughs> but so many people who go to seminary don't really get involved in the courses that that uh, that study the Gospels carefully. They go, they take courses on on how to run the church, on church history, on how to do worship. Um, I was. Um, in my book, I call myself the contrarian seminarian. I had gone to church all my life, but when I got to seminary, you know, daily chapel was there for everybody to go to. And I said, wait a minute, that's really not right. And so the whole time I was at Boston University School of Theology, I never went to chapel. Everybody else went to chapel because I thought that was a compromise of critical thinking, a compromise of what we were there to do, find out the truth. If you're going to chapel, you're saying, oh, here, I have the truth. I'm going to worship the truth. Now I'm going to convince myself even more of how this is true or others. Yeah. And the, the, the sad thing is a lot of people who do end up going to seminary, and I almost went myself, but I relapsed when I was in struggling with drug addiction. And I'm glad it happened. <laughs> to be honest with you, because I mean, it, my path took me a different way in how I ended up waking up and realizing, hold on, I need to examine this. But I would have ended up a pastor of some church. I would mm -hmm. have been in, in a bad situation, changing my mind every time I turn around. But most people who end up in seminary, from what the people I've discussed this with, is they know these problems. In fact, a lot of these seminaries are teaching these issues. But when they're presenting and chewing up the information and giving it to the congregation, this mm. is not what they preach from the pulpit. And they're not informing you. Oh, excuse me. Bump my knee. They're not really giving you, okay, first of all, this could create a problem. No, 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 no. It, it's there to ex, what is it, exhort, to lift up, to encourage. And it's pretty much a social gospel kind of message oftentimes. Now, I can't universalize this and every Christian does the same thing. Of mm. course not. But generally speaking, you're, I wish that it was more like, all right, we're going to give you the facts. We're going to lay it out. And at the end of the day, this is what we like about Jesus. This is what we want to tell you. But there are problems with the narrative or whatever. Mm. But when you get like you and Hector Avalos, which I got a whole section of his books over here on my bookshelf. I had to buy them. I was like, you know what? Uh, let, let me dive into them. I emailed him. Before he died, it was a probably a month, and he said, "I can't even talk." Mm. Like he he typed it out. He says, "I can't even talk." He was dying of cancer, and um, he did, of course, pass from cancer. But he was like, "I can't tell you how bad I wish I could have come on your episode yeah, to yeah. teach." Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and I like to point out to people who who try all sorts of mental gymnastics to get around Luke teen. Luke 14, 26, you have to hate your family to be my disciple. Hector Avalos has a 39-page chapter in his book, The Bad Jesus, on precisely that verse and why it means exactly what it seems to mean. That's what I, I mean, when I look at Jehovah's Witnesses, when I look at other cultic groups that are literally practicing their families reject the faith and their families aren't believing that they are, you know, in the right uh, belief system. We look at Mark, Mark, Jesus's family literally is convinced he's nuts. Yes. <laughs> they think he's crazy. And 
your mother and your brother are outside. Who are my mother and my brother? It's you in the fold, in our cult. Those who are in this movement are my mother and my brother and my sister. And, and so it is a cultic ment mentality. And mm -hmm. when I look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, I know I see it as horrible, but I honestly admit they are more accurate on the teaching of Jesus following this practice mm -hmm. than what typical Christians are. Now, I would rather Christians not practice what yeah, Jesus yeah, yeah, says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing I'm trying to portray here. But what you're saying, even yesterday, James <laughs> Tabor again, the Greek word there is hate. Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I yeah, have some super chats too, by the way. So whenever you want, we'll jump to questions and we'll come back to those one, two punches. Cause we haven't even started on the two punch knockout yet. Well, we kind of did, I guess a little yeah, bit. Not. Yeah. But the second punch, um, and I want to be sure to, you know, it was Margaret Downey, um, in one of her essays, um, this she is was, the first punch, right? Margaret Downey did read the whole encyclopedia that you write about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I wish I was as had been as rebellious and curious as she was. <laughs> she read the text in Mark in Matthew 19, I think it was, that uh, with God all things are possible. She slammed her Bible shut in church and said, Jeez, with God things all, all things are possible. I don't think so. And um she she pestered her mother to get that encyclopedia. And when she got it, she made the vow, I'm going to read the whole thing, A to Z. And she did. And that's when she discovered that there were other gods worshipped in the ancient world. And that's what led into my one, first of my one, two punches. Uh, it was a an atmosphere swarming with gods. And that fed into the, uh, into the, Christian imagination as they created their portrait of Jesus. But the second punch um, has to do with the problem of evil, the problem of suffering, the problem of suffering. Um, this is my father's world, the old famous hymn goes, and people want to believe that. But when you stop to think of the suffering that is built in to the human condition, how can this possibly be God's intelligent design? The first example I give, for example, is genetic diseases. There are thousands of gen genetic diseases. You look at a newborn baby and you say, how perfect and how wonderful. You don't know what genetic diseases may be programmed into that tiny body. And so much incalculable suffering because of that. Um, you can blame it on evolution, but Christians are reluctant to do that but if you say evolution didn't do it then who did it well how can you get god off the hook for that level of suffering um also the placing of the human race on a planet that is so chaotic and by that i mean volcanoes earthquakes hurricanes tornadoes plagues uh tsunamis um I think it was John Hout who pointed out that 80,000 to, 80, 80, to 100,000 infants and toddlers died in that tsunami. How can that possibly have happened if there's a good God paying attention, a powerful God, a caring God? And I list quite a few items on the, you know, the, the suffering that goes on. Infant mortality, uh, child mortality for um, for a millennia before the invention of modern me medicine. Um, this is the work, this is the way God planned it, that there'd be so much suffering. I think I listed eight or 12, eight or 10 points of the kind of suffering that, that goes on in this world. And then I come back to Margaret Downey's statement, with God, all things are possible. Really? Well, how about arranging things that, all this suffering doesn't take place. The aging process is one that I mentioned. We biodegrade while we're still alive. Um, the pain and the humili humiliation that goes with that old age or even middle age as, as the body breaks down and one 
capacity or another. That doesn't and, sound And right. the reason, even if you wanted to be a fundamentalist, the reason all of this pain and suffering when they try to obviously pin it on man and not blame God. Free will. Is because the wife ate the fruit. <laughs> like God gave that much of a crap about a tree in a garden <laughs> and a piece of fruit that he's willing. If you put just like as a human, put it in perspective, you're like, really? Did that equate? Like, did, maybe it would be something if like Adam in the mythology was somehow on par with God and then he betrays God and like, I don't know, murdered God's wife or something like, like then he, at least God could be vindictive enough to try and like do something back. You ate a piece of fruit. He said, don't eat. And then the snake had more accurate truth about what was going to take place than the God who put you in the garden to begin with. There are so many problems if you take this approach. And so I'm with you. Like there's a lot here. Number one, I wanted to have you clarify something because we really passed over your one punch. That okay. is there are other gods and that people worship other gods, that the world contains the belief in other deities. Like this is a big problem. Can you clarify or give a little more detail as to why that's such a knockout punch toward Christianity for, for many people? I see it as a problem now, but when I was a Christian, I had like a special force field in my brain about how well, this is the one true one and all the others. But it's like, there are thousands upon thousands of people who really believe that they're doing the right thing, believing in the right gods. Tell us how that's a problem. Well, in the very introduction to the article, I, I point out, you're not going to have a Catholic priest stand up in his pulpit on Sunday morning and recommend that everybody in the congregation should um, should get the book, of, get a hold of the Book of Mormon and study it. Maybe the Mormons are right. And you're not going to find a Southern Baptist preacher who's going to say to his congregation, I want all of you to go to Catholic churches for the next month. They may be the one true religion. And no Methodist minister is going to stand up and say, I want everybody in, the, in this congregation to go out and get the Quran and read it. Maybe the, uh, maybe the Muslims are right about all this after all. There's so, and that's just three examples. There are so many hundreds, thousands of gods that have been believed on the basis of what? Because some holy person, some holy man usually, uh, I had a dream, I had a vision, I had a revelation, I'm in direct contact with the gods. And people believe it. People believe it. Uh, what's the basis for doing that? That's why... One of my constant themes in my articles is curiosity, question everything. Where did that story come from? Did it come from a God? Come on, uh, ask for evidence, ask for data, reliable, verifiable, objective data, evidence, before you say, okay, I believe Jesus was the son of God. Who came up with that idea? Could that person who came up with that idea offer solid evidence? So, you know, number one, you look fit for a boxing match almost being 80 years old. I just have to point <laughs> that out. Number one. Number two, I like what Dom Crossan said the other day. I had John Dominic Crossan on, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, he had a debate with uh, a Muslim, and he said to the Muslim, if you pushed Islam and Muhammad back into the first century, if you were the game in town with all the other gods and, and holy men and figures and divine claimants and whatnot, if your prophet was not claiming to be a son of God, he would have never even lifted off the ground. At that time in history, you had all these sons of gods. Mm -hmm. And in order to be competitive and be the ruler in that time, you needed to be a son of God, but a better one, of course. So let's invent a better version of a son of God than the ones that are around us. And sure enough, he pointed out that, like, of course, Islam in the 7th century in Arabia has success where they're against this idea of deicide, the idea that God mm. actually died on the cross. So like, when God died, there's a problem with that. And of course, Muslims point that out. The Quran paints that picture. But it's interesting that in the time, the culture, the milieu, where it's at, the portrayal of what you're getting as the package is what you see. 
And so I, I think it's so human. The thumbprints are all over the place. Just look mm. for the human thumbprint. And when you see it, do you need the angel Gabriel to have told you this? Do you need, you know, the angel Moroni or do you need, you know, Joseph Smith or, or do you need Moses to have actually got this from God on a mountain or could a human looking at the Hammurabi code, for example, or other ancient near Eastern law codes, couldn't a human have concocted the 10 commandments? Hmm. hmm. Don't you think it's bad that we kill our neighbors? Cause you don't like it when they do that to you. Do you common sense? So this is stuff that, you know, you can imagine men made. We have a war God. I wonder who's having wars all the time in the middle East, in the ancient near East, you know, he, men. So the God is a reflection of a man and not the other way around. Um, I want to get to the super chat here and okay. we will take, that and jump back and forth wherever you want to go. So feel free to interject, interrupt, however you want to do this. Doc Pleromana, thank you, Doc, for being a member and for the super chat. The textual variant, this is my body added to the original Lucan Last Supper, looks like an infused late doctrine of atonement and contra repentance for salvation. Revisionist scribal anti-docetism? By the way, Doc, I got to interview you one day. Your questions kind of show, you know, a thing or two. So <laughs> we got to talk. Well, um, my first question would be the, the original Luke and last supper. How much did Luke borrow from Mark? Because Matthew and Luke both borrowed heavily from Mark's gospel. And, and where did Mark get the text? for the Last Supper, the so-called Last Supper. We had to look at 1 Corinthians 11, where, where Paul talks about, it's not the Last Supper, but Paul talks, he has the basic script of the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11. And he didn't get it from any human source, he got it as a revelation from, from Jesus, from the Lord. And there have been several studies now that indicate that Mark was heavily influenced by Paul's theology. So what we find in Mark, the text of the Eucharist, likely was borrowed from one of Paul's letters. And then, of course, Luke put it into narrative form with an upper room with, um, with disciples sitting around. Leonardo da Vinci put them all on the same side of the table for whatever reason. Um, but um, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper itself, is probably pious fiction. It's, it's invented narrative. And interestingly enough, the Gospel of John does not have the Eucharist at the Last Supper. In fact, the closest you get to the Eucharist is in John chapter 6, where he has that grotesque statement about unless you drink the blood of Jesus and eat the flesh of Jesus, you don't have life in you, um, which I think was probably the basis for the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. But, um, and of course, the, then you, the revi revisionist scripture the real irony, of course, is that fundamentalists will, will claim that we have the revealed word of God. But Bart Ehrman, when he got into serious study of the Bible, he said, wait a minute, we don't have the original versions. The earliest scrap that we have of any New Testament uh, manuscript is about the size of a credit card. It's part of the 18th chapter of John, and it's dated to maybe middle, early to mid second century. There are no complete manuscripts of the New Testament until the fourth century, which meant for generation after generation after generation, these manuscripts were copied by hand. Uh, things were added, things were deleted, uh, things that were noted in the margin, the next scribe included in the text itself. So we have no way of knowing what the original manuscripts of any of the Bible books actually said. Uh, if God inspired the Bible, he was pretty sloppy about having it preserved correctly. 
um, that's back to what you were mentioning, Derek, about interpolations. Mm -hmm. uh, you come across something that, wow, that doesn't fit. That doesn't sound right. Well, maybe it's because somebody inserted it later. I mean, the famous eighth chapter of John's gospel, the woman taken in adultery. That was not in the, that's not in the earliest manuscripts we have of the gospel of John. That's in fact, in some manuscripts that ended up in Luke, um, we have no idea where the story came from. No idea, whatever. Was it really about Jesus or was it a scribal invention somewhere along the way? It's a floating story. I do like in this question, Doc brings up the idea of a late doctrine of atonement contra repentance for salvation, but revisionist scribal anti docetism because it makes you wonder. There were docetists, and mm. these people believe Jesus didn't have a body. Luke has some weird stuff going on in that ghost story on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. And you, you're kind of like, they don't recognize who he is at all mm. until he blesses and breaks the bread or something in that house, which I think is another Eucharist kind of, um, mm -hmm. he's in our presence, but he doesn't, he's not physically there, so to speak. But I don't, as soon I don't, as he breaks the bread, poof, he's gone. Right. He disappears. And that sounds kind of like what that, that I, th I could imagine. I, I, mean, I can't read the minds, but I could imagine docetists going, yep. See, like, and then you got to imagine, like, are they going to put Jesus physically in here to try and, like, reject this docetic message? And there seemed to be beef in Luke, in a proto version of Luke Marcion had, where I think it's Tertullian's talking about redactions taking place and claiming Marcion had changed the gospel. But I've asked other scholars, like M. David Litwell and others, and they think that the other way around might be the case, that Tertullian the anti-heresiologist may have actually tampered with this version of the gospel of Luke, a pre-Lucan gospel that Marcion had, and they orthodoxed it, mm. so to speak. So is Doc right that they are inserting non-docetic, non-Marcion ideas into this gospel? I mean, you know, we can have fun and try to like, but that's the problem with the evidence. There's so much going on here. Doc, I finally got one of your questions on point. You're just so over my head half of the time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, and by the way, um, Robert Connor wrote a book called um, Apparitions of Jesus, mm. The Resurrection as Ghost Story. I got it on my shelf behind in, me, yeah. In which he argues that so much of what we find in the resurrection stories seems to reflect ghost folklore of the ancient world. Um you're really off the trail of history. You're really into, I call it religious fantasy literature. <laughs> and, the, and the folks in the pews are saying, ah, ah, wonderful, wonderful. I, by the way, I got it. It's funny you brought his name up. Maybe there is something looking out for us. I don't know. <laughs> uh, he emailed me this morning and uh, he's sending me an autographed copy of the Jesus cult is on the way. Me too. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking for. He emailed you this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. He oh, gave so me the tracking. He gave me the tracking number, which includes six six six. Birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> oh man! So, um, as far as the other gods idea is concerned, we talked about this. We we brought up that uh, one punch, which is other gods, and in that you bring up the dying and rising gods idea. Um, I hear always Christians argue against this and try to go, no, there's we're not doing what Zeitgeist did and trying to Xerox copy and pretend that they're all perfectly exactly identical, but but the genre, the the idea, the motifs are there. Mm. We all as humans die, and as far back as Gilgamesh mortality was on the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go all the way back. And what do we not want to do? Die and that be it. So mm -hmm. mythologies develop and hopes and dreams develop that that isn't the end. And they have remarkable so, staying power. They have what? Remarkable staying power, endurance. Because mm -hmm. if you're told from the time you were a toddler that if you believe in Jesus, 
you'll get eternal life. I, I know a devout Catholic woman who she arrived at the point she wouldn't even talk to me any longer because she said her great hope, her fond hope, is to see her mother again in heaven. She doesn't want anything to undermine her faith. Yeah. That's the only thing that matters. What do you do in that kind of situation personally? Everybody's a little different. But when someone says that to you, I personally give them that space and respect it. That's me personally. But where yeah, do you yeah. stand? No, no, I, I back off. I see. Bye, Felicia. You know, I'm not doing it. <laughs> you're, not, you're not somebody I can dialogue with because you're not willing to think about it. Yeah, you're but I mean, there's there's obviously a real issue, something deep, and and I don't think logic or rationality or anything like that is going to get through at least during mm. that trauma. I feel like there's kind of a trauma there, a fear that's deeper than they'd rather live with that just so that they feel more comforted. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I get it. Death is scary. I get it. We all mm -hmm. at some point fear it. And I go to to bed sometimes and think about it and go, damn, I wish there was something after this. But mm -hmm. I also don't put my life's existence and hope in imagining what I wish were the case is true. <laughs> I don't know. How do you feel about that? Well, um, some atheists don't want there to be something after. And I'm like, I wish there was a party still going, even though I don't think there's going to be. And I don't think I'm going to be worried about it because it's it. When it's over, it's over. But when I'm dead, I won't know I'm dead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, I do wish I could live long enough to see Trump dead. Uh, but that's, another, <laughs> that, that's another issue <laughs> to find out <clears throat> if the world is going to total shit like we were afraid it's going. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, my 80th birthday is this month. My dad lived to 85. My mother lived to 92. <clears throat> I've got another book I'm, I want to write, you know, <clears throat> my wheelie articles in the debunking Christianity blog. Those keep me going. Um, a lot more I have to say, a lot more I have to do. Uh, but, um, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Jesus might come back next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Cheryl, thank you for the super chat. How do you respond to scholars such as Dan Wallace who say, with the thousands of manuscripts we do have, we can get back to the originals? Thank you, Cheryl, for the super chat and always being in the chat. Nobody's ever done it. I mean, there are scholars who spend their entire lives <clears throat> comparing, comparing thousands of of old manuscripts <clears throat> in the hope that they can get back to seeing what the original manuscripts actually said. But there's no way to verify that. Unless suddenly somehow we came up with the, the, the original manuscript that left Mark's hand, for example. And how would we even verify that that's what we have? Um, I mean, scholars are working very hard at this, but um, for example, I think in the first or second chapter of um, First Thessalonians, Paul has a, there's a few sentences there which are uncharacteristically anti-Semitic. And many scholars have said, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like Paul, uh, just because of the, the vicious way he states it. And so many scholars think that's probably an interpolation but there's no way to verify one way or the other. It just sounds so unlike Paul, crazy as he was. Um, this, this diatribe against Jews in First Thessalonians just seems out of character. You know but, what's interesting? I've interviewed Bart Ehrman quite a few times. Mm. He's a textual variant manuscript scholar. I mean, like his sure. actual specialty is literally in taking that magnifying glass to actual original manuscripts, cross-examining the thousands of manuscripts we have to find problems. And I've asked him stuff that goes into like the various manuscript traditions. And some of the stuff we have later, he thinks he's like, that's just so odd and so mm. sounding primitive. That sounds original. And this other stuff over here, 
seems like it is an original. So it's almost like even with the manuscript tradition, at the end of the day, there is the eye of the beholder and it is this subjective perspective that they're like, well, I think that that's what it originally said. And Oh, I think so when people like Daniel Wallace come and say, we have it. And I know that he's like an apologist scholar, by the way, I interviewed him, Cheryl, or I not interviewed him. I, I sent him an email and shoot, I might as well read it out. Cause I'm never going to get the chance to, to interview him because <laughs> he wrote me back. Um, okay. Dan Wallace. Let me just type in Wallace because I think this is worth pointing out. Um, I wrote him, good evening from North Carolina, uh, Professor Daniel Wallace. I'm the host of a show called Myth Vision with now over 50,000 subscribers. I'd love to interview you on your research to promote your works as well as educate the general public on these topics. Here's a list of interviews I've done. And I mean, talk about credentials for Myth Vision, right? I've got like top-notch world-class academics. He responded, thank you for the invitation, Derek, but I'm afraid my schedule is way too, too packed for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Tell me that's not saying I'm not interested in coming on your show right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, most academics I get, and I could probably, if we did a textual variant manuscript or <laughs> email comparison to all of the academics I've gotten responses from, like none of them ever say like my foreseeable future just doesn't look like there's any possibility that I could ever join you. And I wish I could, because I'd like to ask him about the first century claims of us finding manuscripts that date to the seventies and eighties AD. Cause he was part of that whole thing as a scholar claiming we have first century manuscripts come to find out they weren't first century. They were third or fourth. They were way later. And he was, telling all these Christians who are soaking it in like a sponge <laughs> and now they're being told lies. So like, why did you jump on the bandwagon as a critical scholar? Why did you do this? I want to know more. And I wouldn't be too aggressive, but I would be curious. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, it's like a subjective conclusion at the end of the day. Yes, there's a science involved. Don't get me wrong, but it kind of comes down to, does this pericope look older well, I think it looks older because of this. Does this pericope look later? I think it's later because of this. And they all have their own little interpretation. And that's the problem when you get into this stuff. And that's why we have dozens of different quote unquote historical Jesuses because scholars yeah. will look at the various gospel stories and say, oh, I think that's authentic. I think that's authentic. But none of them have come up with a reliable, <coughs> verifiable methodology for determining what in the Gospels is actually historical because there are no contemporary documentation. It just doesn't exist. Okay, another super chat here. Benny, thank you for the super chat. Benny, Dave Armstrong, Catholic apologist, has said that you have been ignoring him. He has a blog post criticizing your take on the Gospel of Number 10, chapter 11. Do you know who he's talking about? Dave Armstrong. Makes me want to look him up. Um, I've been... It, it, does he mean you or I have been ignoring him? Great question. I'm looking up... Okay, Dave Armstrong. Biblical evidence for Catholicism with Dave Armstrong. Pathios.com. He is a Catholic author and apologist who has been actively proclaiming and defending Christianity since 1981 and Catholicism in particular since 1991, full time since December 2001. Formerly a campus missionary as a Protestant, Dave was received into the Catholic Church in February 91 by the late well known catechist and theologian. What is this? Uh, John A. Hardin, S.J. Dave's articles have appeared in many influential Catholic uh, periodicals, including. It's a long, I'm not going to read all that. There's a lot to read there, but James, brother of Jesus, Josephus versus the Bible. Why doesn't scripture call Jesus an only child? Oh, so he's probably, he's probably thinking Jesus didn't have siblings, even though the gospel of Matthew talks about uh, Joseph knowing Mary after. <laughs> um, well, the Catholic, he's... the Catholic Dodge is usually these were cousins yeah, or children by Joseph's first marriage, yada, yeah. yada, yada. <clears throat> guess we're yeah, expecting some wishful mm. thinking 
Yeah, interesting. I don't know. So you haven't seen this guy? I haven't seen this guy. Benny, I've never seen an email from this person. So I don't, I don't imagine this is me. But it's saying your take on the gospel of number 10, chapter 11. Is this the 10 things Christians wish Jesus never taught book? Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to open that book and see. I mean, we're talking, what was number 10? Remember now, uh, uh, Dr. Madison even though he wrote the book, may not remember exactly numbers of what <laughs> each chapter says. Oh, where are we at? Giving you the benefit of the doubt here. Okay, 10 is I will return during your lifetime. Hmm. Chapter 11, though, for obstacles knowing what Jesus said. Four obstacles to know to knowing what Jesus said. I don't know. You don't know who this person is? I think I've heard of him vaguely, but... Um, <clears throat> I've never had an e- email or a message from him. Hmm. Ben, um, I don't know. Uh, I appreciate the super chat, the support. Feel free to email me and if you ever have anything further to follow up on that. But thanks a lot. Oh, snap. We got a big old super chat here. You just earned eternal salvation by this indulgence, my friend. George Nelson, thank you for the hundred. What about the communist commandments and rules of the church in Acts 2? I off a needle, mammon, private property, and the Lord cannot be both served. The Canaanite woman and Jews only are the focus of the Jesus cult. Well, the the statement in Acts that the the church, everyone uh, owned property in common. Um, that's probably what he means by the communist commandments. Um, I'm not sure what I off a needle. Hmm. I, I imagine it's just the early Acts 2 community where they had yeah. all things together and like, Ananias and Sapphira, I think her name was, were killed by the Holy Spirit for lying yeah, about yeah, keeping yeah. a little bit of money and stuff. Eye off of a needle. I don't know about the eye off of a needle. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank off that one. Mammon, of course, you can't serve money and the Lord. Mm-hmm. You can't have two masters. I know about that. Do you have uh, something to say about that particular one? Because I have something that I could point out. Maybe you want to emphasize is that the other day we did a... a gospel thing with Dr. James Tabor, and he points out how Luke has blessed are the poor. Matthew has blessed are the poor in spirit. So it sounds like Matthew's in line with some rich people who are like, we got to keep our money, man. But we could just say you were poor in spirit, right? And those are the blessed ones. It it reminds me of that whole uh, 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 life of Brian, you know, blessed are the cheesemakers. Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Why are they saying two different things? And they mean two different things. Mm-hmm. You can be rich, but be poor in spirit. You can't be blessed are the poor and actually be rich. So there's a theological and a completely different impact with that particular verse or those ideas. What do you think? And how many thousands of different sermons have been preached on those texts and their differences? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> probably a thousand preachers have come up with a thousand different answers. That's another problem with the whole idea that the Bible is inspired. Well, Christians have been fighting about it for, for millennia. Uh, I've often said God should have established a, a Bible Supreme Court to say this is what it means, period. Right. Well, you know, he sent Constantine to try and help at least with <laughs> something, right? <laughs> only uh, late to the party by, I don't know, 300 something years. But uh, what do you do? You know, um, The Canaanite woman and Jews only are the focus of the Jesus cult. So I wouldn't say only, but there is an interesting part in Matthew where he says, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but it's not found in the other gospels. So he does call her uh, the Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman, depending on which gospel you read, a dog. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, because that's being polite, you know, it's just that's the nice thing to call women who are 
wanting whatever you have to offer, you know, Hey dog, <laughs> only the children get the bread, you know, <laughs> I'm being silly. I got, I, I he sent a hundred dollars. So I just figured <laughs> I'd like want to show him some love, you know, for, for doing that. I appreciate that, George. Seriously. Any other comments on this uh, super chat that you could think of? Are there any more? Yeah, no, I'm saying on this one, on this particular, no, no. nothing else. No. George, thank you for that super chat. I really appreciate the support, my friend. Um, if you have anything that we didn't get, email me, especially for the support. I'll be happy to send it to David and what, me and I'll screenshot his response or copy and paste and just send it back to you, give you give you his thoughts. But I uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Seriously. Um, so, Okay. What else do you want to address before we wrap things up, Dr. Madison? And I, I want to make sure we plug your works before we let you go. Um, well, <clears throat> one, two punch. Um, in my book, 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief, <clears throat> I talk about, um, I talk about eight other major problems that, that undermine Christianity. Uh, my belief is that any one of them, any two of them, the ones I've discussed here, are enough to blow Christianity out of the water. But when you combine all 10, one of the most common comments I got in 2016 when the book was published was, only 10? <clears throat> this comment came from atheists. <laughs> I swept a lot of problems into those 10 categories. Um, but you know, it's just, it's one of the most difficult things in the world to get Christians to think about these things. Uh, when my new, new book was published last year, um, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught, I gave autographed copies to quite a few of my Christian friends. Here's an easy book, it can be read in a couple of settings. What was the response? Silence not even thank yous, silence. They didn't want to think about it. Hmm. Uh, they want to trust what the preachers said, what their parents said, what their Sunday school teachers have said. They don't want to think about it because uh, that's not encouraged. You know, yesterday I watched a video by a Christian apologist, Michael Jones, Inspiring Philosophy, and he did a crit critique of the documentary Hypothesis. I watched it. It was actually a really well um, edited video. He brought up some interesting criticisms, and it, I, I thanked him. I actually shared it out. was like, bravo, you have got the wheels turning in my head and in others. And I plan on getting academics who know the documentary hypothesis, who know the supplementary hypothesis, fragmentary hypothesis. I want critical scholars to come on, pick apart these ideas, deal with why there are different names for God. Are they just synonymous? Or are they really two different names for two different gods? He later on get merged. All of these kind of things I want to dive into. And I wanted to thank him because he did such a great job in that at least getting people's appetites wet to want to go deeper. And I don't think many Christians or atheists expected me to be like, good job to a Christian apologist for doing this, because it's going to encourage more people to engage, to get interested in the topic. I'm convinced that the more we learn, the more we realize how humans operate. We'll figure mm. out how these humans may have created these documents, why they may have written some of this material and things like that. So just like some Christians shouldn't be afraid, right? It's the truth. So if it is the truth, I'm playing a psychological kind of point here. It's like, dig into it. You cannot be afraid if it's true. Go all the way, just mm -hmm. like I was willing to do, just like you were willing to do. And if at the end of the day, you draw the conclusion that it's true, I'm almost certain you wouldn't even look the same in the way you started. So you'd be way <laughs> probably more progressive in your thinking. You'd probably go, ah, I'm going to take that as allegory or... Uh, I can't take that literally, whatever, the more serious of a student you're going to be. So I just encourage everybody, like you said, curiosity, ask questions, dive in. And if they really want to be saved, like true salvation, get the dang books, <laughs> right? I mean, this is the only way. This, if you are like a camel and you can't fit through the eye of a needle, 
This book makes you able to do that. You can get through the eye of a needle, no problem. Tell <laughs> us about your books here, uh, Dr. Madison, before I let you go. Well, the 2016 book was my first book, uh, <clears throat> 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief. That's available on uh, paperback and Kindle. Um, the second book, uh, the one published last year, that's an outgrowth of the ninth chapter, the ninth problem <clears> that I discussed. Um, in the website for the book, um, Bad Things Jesus Taught, there's a list of 292 Jesus Oh, quotes. that's on the website, right? Which one is yeah. that? Which website? Uh, BadThingsJesusTaught.com. Got it. And this okay. is under 292 Bad Jesus mm -hmm. Quotes. Okay. Nice. They're divided into four categories. I read, <clears throat> I reread the Gospels thoroughly for the umpteenth time. <laughs> and I, I, I maintained, I created an Excel spreadsheet. And every time I came across a Jesus quote that, you know, rankled me for some reason, one of these four categories, then I put it on the Excel spreadsheet. And that basically is what ended up here on this website. It was too long to put it at the back of the book. But there it's available on the website. Um, but preaching about the end time, um, scary extremism, bad advice and bad theology, and finally for the unreal Jesus of John's gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, egregiously egotistical, um, terribly, terribly full of himself. But um, this is a book that I think Again, it's highly readable. It, it can be read in one or two sittings. Uh, and it really, I think, is also a knockout punch. Why do Christians it, just ignore these? That's why, that's why I said if you're washing dishes or you're mowing the grass, you could put some earbuds in. You <laughs> literally can, if you play it at like one and a half times speed, I think, or two. I can't mm -hmm. remember how I had it. But I went through your whole book, I think, in two and a half, three hours. And it mm -hmm. was being read... Um, being read by Seth Andrews, mm -hmm. I, you know what? I might as well do it. I might as well go to Audible for a second just to let people get a teaser. If you haven't listened to it, it's a fun, fun read. It's actually in my library. Everybody's going to see my dang library here. All right, let's see. What do we have here? Uh, am I in my library? Yeah. We're going to find it together. Okay, second. You get to see some of my reading list. Ooh, there, there, you go. there you go. So listening now. All right. Okay, hold on. Now I got to share my screen to let people hear it together. And they can hear the, if you haven't heard an angel's voice, <laughs> this is it. As a throne and earth as a footstool. And so much trouble has been caused by giving special status to Jerusalem. A few Christians do refuse to swear on a Bible because of these words spoken by Jesus. At least they're trying to be consistent. But for most believers I know... Ref anyway, he's super clear. You can't mistake what he's saying. And I hope people will go get the book. Um, it's, it's a fun read, and it doesn't take long. And I've already gone through it twice. So the least you can do is go through it once. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, you mentioned the dying and rising thing. I did have a video, and I'm surprised it does, only has 13,000 views because the editing, the amount of editing I put into this was just really a ton into the various different gods from Inanna, you name it. I go way back and just through all the gods he brings up in the article. Your article about today's episode was here, and I said, all right, I got to interview Dr. Madison on this. One, two punch Christianity, and Christianity out cold. And uh, they could subscribe to your your uh, blog, right, or to the articles, so that they get emailed. Um, yeah, uh, you go on to www.debunking-christianity.com. Hyphen, got it. Go check it out. Look at all the books on the right hand side. These are recommended books as well. And then there's the Patreon. Join our Patreon, get salvation. Uh, I really hope you do. That I'm, I'm going to catch up on all the messages. I just moved to Washington State, and I've been busting my hump since getting here and getting this house in order, getting the shows going. Dr. Madison, are there any 
any final words, positive words, encouraging words to our audience you would like to leave them with? Um, well, just a plug, <clears throat> get my book. Um, I publish an article every Friday on the Debunking Christianity blog. So um, <clears throat> I'm there every Friday. And uh, people are welcome to comment on every article. So thank you very much, Derek, for having me on again. Thank you. It's thank always you. an honor and a pleasure. Um, true salvation through David Madison, everybody, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like the video. If you don't agree, drop a comment. Tell us how wrong we are and share it out there so other people are engaged in the conversation. They can tell us how wrong we are as well. Uh, but never forget, we are Myth Vision. Thank you.